So my topic today is peace in the home. And the clip we saw earlier from that classic holiday movie, A Christmas Story, zooms us straight into the heart of that topic. Family space is crowded space, crowded with the needs and the emotions of all the members that are there in that family, what the, each member brings. The crowding gets only more intense as the holidays come. Youngest son, Randy, he is ripping open his gift and the child voice, his voice pipes up with, wow, wowee, a Zeppelin. While the same, at the same time, his father opens up a gift from his wife and it is a can of Simon eyes. And the father's response is the opposite of Randy's. Simon eyes does not inspire youthful dreams. Simon eyes is about car maintenance. The father feels so old. Later, the mother delivers to her husband another gift, plops it on his lap. It's heavy. He jerks up in shock and maybe some pain. And to accentuate this, he says in a squeaky high voice, thanks a lot. He's not unpleasant about it, but you get the feeling that something is not quite right. We all know what the gift is before he tears open the wrapping, a bowling ball. But we are still surprised when it appears as he says, well, it's a blue ball. <laughs> this is but one moment of a larger thread of sexual frustration and loneliness that runs through the entire movie. We see the father turning towards objects of sexual fantasy that are not like his wife, very different from his wife. He does not turn to her. He abandons her instead to the busyness of being a mother, and it angers her. But the anger is unconscious to her. She is not consciously aware of it. So it comes out in accidental ways, like how she just plops the bowling ball on his lap. It's at this exact moment that the camera swivels to show young Randy playing with his Zeppelin. He's going round and around on the floor. But at that exact moment when plop, Randy looks up. He looks up to watch his parents, his innocent, round as saucers eyes, drinking everything in. Children absorb the unspoken feelings and unrealized yearnings of the parents. In a family, there are truly no secrets. But then comes the whole pink bunny suit episode. The mother is simply delighted at the creativity of Aunt Clara. Ralphie suspects that Aunt Clara thinks he's still four years old and a girl to boot. He wants nothing to do with it. His mother insists that he put it on. He stomps upstairs. He does what his mother wants. He stomps downstairs. And his mother says, that's the most precious thing I've ever seen in my whole life, she says. But what she doesn't see is a boy who is becoming a man. And that pink bunny suit wounds him. It wounds him. Ralphie's brother, meanwhile, is cracking up there on the floor. Ralphie tells him to shut up. There's a little bit of sibling conflict there for you in the mix. And then his dad says, he looks like a deranged Easter bunny. He looks like a pink nightmare. Essentially, mom and dad are openly disagreeing about how to parent the kids. And that is a source of major stress in any family. And they go back and forth on this, whether or not he should keep on wearing that outfit. And she finally tells him to take the suit off. And you hear the father say, take the suit off. All of this from just two minutes and 37 seconds of a classic holiday film. Family space is crowded space. Crowded with the needs and emotions that each family member brings. The insight immediately gives rise to two key questions. Number one, if this is what family is all about, then who needs it? Number two, if this is what family is all about, 
then how is peace possible? Take that first question, who needs family? It is a very strange question to be asking because first of all, a family of some kind is the biological and psychological prerequisite for becoming born and for growing up. Egg and sperm, they got to come together somehow. But even if that meeting happens through in vitro fertilization, still the single mother and her child are a family surrounded by extended family and friends. And from that context, a child gets the raw materials out of which they will build a life, the raw emotional and intellectual materials. No one can make a life out of nothing. The raw materials come from family. But let me hasten to say that such raw materials are going to be valid even if they do not come from a certain kind of family, say, a structure that echoes the iconic American nuclear family of the movie with a married mother and father together with children. If that were the case, then 80% of American families today would be providing children with the wrong kind of raw materials. These days, only 20% of families are like family in the movie. The conservative conception of family is just not right. As a Unitarian Universalist, I define family as people committing to each other, to be reliable and respectful partners in life. And if children are involved and those children experience a loving home where they're able to grow into their beautiful personal potentials, their human potentials, opposite sex partners, same sex partners, single parent or whatever other options there may be, all make for valid family structures. If love is at the center, now, a moment ago, I called the question, who needs family, strange. And there is another reason why I said that. Desire for family is not really given to us as a choice. The deep desire is always there, born with us, in us. But it can get fulfilled in ways that may look very different from popular uh, definitions of family. Psychologist Thomas Moore speaks to this profoundly in his book, Soulmates, Honoring the Mysteries of Love and Relationship. A family, he says, is, it's not an abstract cultural ideal. A man, a woman, children living blissfully in a mortgaged house on a quiet neighborhood street. The family, the soul wants, is a felt network of relationships, an evocation of a certain kind of interconnection that grounds, roots, and nestles. Makes me think of our Unitarian Universalist hymn, Spirit of Life, right? Roots hold me close, wings set me free. Moore continues, people working on a project together, they may feel the presence of family as they talk, work, get to know each other. When we hope that our nation can hold together as a family or that the family of nations can live in peace, these are not metaphors, but rather the expressions of a profound need of the soul for a special grounded way of relating that offers deep, unconditional, and lasting security. Family is one of the soul's most longed for pleasures, says Thomas More. And we are busy building family out of whatever works because it is a soul deep need, even for the person who doesn't want a committed relationship or, or, or a, a marriage, even for the person who doesn't want any children. Family for such a person is friends. It is church community. It is work. It is the place they go where everybody knows their name. Family is not a choice. So let's now turn to that other question about peace. How is peace in the family possible? Well, how are we defining peace? By peace, are we meaning the absence of struggle? Are we meaning the absence of adults getting gifts or giving gifts that are bad, right? Make people feel old. The absence of loneliness and anger the absence of children absorbing the imperfections of their parents side by side with all the good things that they absorb? 
How about the absence of disagreements on how to parent, the absence of sibling conflict, the absence of deranged Easter bunnies and pink nightmares? Ugh. I hope we will not be defining peace like this. That way, peace will never be possible for we spiritual beings having a human experience. I say it is better to define peace as Christian theologian Frederick Buechner does. He invokes the Hebrew word for peace, which is shalom. Shalom means fullness. Shalom means having everything you need to be holy and happily yourself. Peace is not the absence of struggle, says Frederick Buechner. It is the presence of love. Imagine this love as a way of seeing and empathizing. We are messy, imperfect beings. Specifically, we have parts within us that are still four years old in emotional age and they somehow fully coexist in strange tension with our adult sense of self. Love here is the capacity to accept this and to tolerate the discomfort of this in ourselves and in our partner and to recognize when it is playing out in our behavior. Recognizing this, saying to ourselves, oh, ah, the inner four-year-old is activated. Okay, I need to calm that down. I need to comfort it. I need to honor it, but in a way that serves my true good and the true good of my relationship and my family. Atheistic philosopher Elaine de Botton illustrates this in his exploration of sulking. How many of you have gone through episodes of sulking or you've witnessed it in others? Wow, and the rest of your arms are broken. <laughs> Just, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> At the heart of a sulk, he says, lies a confusing mixture of intense anger and an equally intense desire not to communicate what you are angry about. The sulker both desperately needs the other person to understand and yet remains utterly committed to doing nothing to help them do so. <laughs> the very need to explain forms the kernel of the insult. If the partner requires an explanation, he or she is clearly not worthy of one. <laughs> now, in the last service, we had amen just come from over here. Just like, I don't, I, I don't know what's going on. Just, just one couple. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> so I connected with them. Maybe I'm connecting with you. If the partner requires an explanation, she's not worthy of one. He's not worthy of one. We should add, says Elaine de Botton, it is a privilege to be the recipient of a sulk. It means the other person respects and trusts us enough to think we should understand their unspoken hurt. It is, he says, one of the otter forms, otter gifts of love. He goes on to say, we would ideally remain able to laugh in the gentlest way when we are made the special target of a sulker's fury. We would recognize the touching paradox. The sulker may be six foot one and holding down adult employment, but the real message is poignantly retrogressive, which is this, deep down I remain an infant, and right now I need you to be my parent, I need you to correctly guess what is truly ailing me as people did when I was a baby and I could never talk and my ideas of love were first form. We do our sulking lovers the greatest possible favor when we are able to see their tantrums as we would those of an infant. Now we are so alive to the idea that it is patronizing to be thought of as younger than we are, we forget that it is also at times the greatest privilege for someone to look beyond our adult exterior in order to engage with and forgive the disappointed, furious, inarticulate child within. Unless the peace that is love is present in our families and relationships and we can see with empathy the complexity underneath our conflicts, we can really get stuck in dysfunctional patterns and we're turning away from each other rather than turning towards each other. 
another example of this beyond sulking has to do, well, it go, has to do with a different side of conflict, different styles of conflict. Each and every family has its own style of conflict. Sometimes it is loud and passionate and full on. Other times it is more emotionally neutral, but you know, you talk things out. Still other times it is sheer avoidance and difficulties. The difficulties are swept under the carpet, right? So let's talk about what happens when two people come together to start building a shared world and their conflict styles do not match. Let's say that one person comes from a family that really like to lay into each other with full sound, full fury, and then make up. And then the other person comes from a family that practice calm avoidance. These two come together. They love each other in the deep way that Elaine de Botton talks about, and therefore conflict happens. The shouter steps up and the avoider steps way, way back. Again, can you relate to that? Again and, oh yeah. Again and again, it happens. And if it keeps happening, I guarantee you, they lose respect for each other. Worse, they can start to see each other as less than human, as, as, as creatures of maliciousness. Have you ever seen that before? A relationship that started out with two people deeply in love, but it ends up with two people treating each other like things to abuse and degrade. Have you seen that? The cause is because the two people fail to see beyond their adult exteriors to the powerful inner child needs that are repeatedly not being fulfilled so that that inner child feels, ends up feeling depressed demoralized, and then lashes out in rage because it is trying to defend its integrity and itself. Or a wife accidentally drops a bowling ball onto her, dog, onto her, her husband's lap, right? Here's what's really happening between the shouter and the avoider. When the shouter steps forward and does their thing, and the avoider steps back, what happens is that the shouter's inner child is left all alone with the problem. They are all alone holding the bag. They are not seen. It is horrible. As for the avoider's experience, they feel unsafe. They feel attacked by someone who is supposed to love them with tenderness. They want to flee. It feels horrible. Again and again, the inner child needs of the one not being seen and understood by the other and vice versa. But the peace that is in the home that is love, that is a capacity to accept and emphasize and, and empathize rather and allow space for complexity, that would help the shouter and that would help the avoider get to a better place. For each to know, first of all, that no one is trying to hurt the other intentionally. Both people are just trying to get deep needs met. One doesn't want to be alone, wants to be seen. One doesn't want to feel unsafe. So how can conflict happen in a way that both partners get their needs met? That is your homework assignment today. Discuss that among yourselves. But now that you know what their needs are, you can come to a solution. Peace in the home is about people getting all the raw materials of life that they need to grow up strong and true. Even as the experience is messy and imperfect, you bring compassion to that. So often, though, what we do bring is perfectionism. How we beat ourselves up because, hey, it's the holidays, and it's all supposed to be all Hallmark card-like, right? And then we give or sometimes get gifts that are crappy. The loneliness and the anger. We beat ourselves up because relationships can be strained, because siblings are bickering, because grudges are harbored, because we have not been able to insulate our children or ourselves from every disappointment, because we haven't been able to do everything right, because deranged Easter bunny and pink nightmare moments we beat ourselves up. But 
this is life. This stuff just happens. Peace in the home is not a perfectionistic absence of struggle. It is the presence of love. It is responding to the struggles lovingly, empathetically, and humanely with a sense of humility. For who are we to expect perfection anyhow? Responding with a sense of humor. A Christmas story. That movie, remember, despite all the serious stuff in it, it is a comedy. Reba McIntyre, favorite philosopher, <laughs> Reba McIntyre says, to succeed in life, you need three things. You need a wishbone, you need a backbone, and you need a funny bone. And I wish that for all of you and yours.